Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on high-performance computing. Today, my guest is from Alinea Software. We have Mark O'Connor. He is the VP of Product Management at the company. Mark, how are you doing today? Hey, Rich. I'm doing great. It's good to hear you again. How are yeah. you? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, you know, it, it's good to have you on. We haven't talked for a while, but uh, I understand you have something to tell us about with energy-efficient computation. What's this, uh, what's this about? Yeah, so I was messing around with this a little bit earlier in the earlier in the month, and it w- it was interesting. So I, I wanted to put a few things together for you on the the slides to show you what I did, um, and yeah, let's let, let let's go and we'll have a talk about it. All right. If there's anyone who doesn't know uh, what linear is, um, you know, we do debugging and and profiling and tuning with performance reports, and what I'm going to be talking about today is kind of linked more to the performance reports side of things. Um, we brought the product out earlier in the year, and since then I've been looking at a lot of these reports of program performance, right? And yeah. a lot of them are memory bound. Uh, here's an example. I think this one's from uh, CP2K, which is the Molecular Dynamics Code, spending you know, 60, 61% of its time just accessing memory. Mm. Um, Another one, it could be open firm, I forget, 74%. You know, this is, it is significant amounts of time. And so, what, so Mark, mostly what, I go to, when, when, when the machine is accessing, is it just doing nothing, waiting? Is, is that what's happening then? It's just, right? Well, I mean, so, so, and the question of what the machine is doing yeah. is very difficult to answer these days because, you know, <laughs> multi-pipeline execution, speculative execution, and, you know, um, but this is what I was asking myself: Is good? You know, the the memory bus is clearly very busy. Yeah. But what are all those cores doing? Mm. Um, and typically, we look at this as a problem and say to people, "Hey, you know, you should profile that code and you know, try and identify these areas here that are using a lot of you know, very high memory access, and perhaps you've got some loop you can optimize there or improve the vectorization or something." You know, it's all about the cache cache performance. Yeah. Um, and we we tell to these people all the time. The I think why I'm seeing this a lot is as we're increasing the core counts, you know, you've got all of these cores and there's some very clever interconnect. Um, it gets clever every year, but ultimately you've got off off chip, you have your main memory yeah. and some bus connecting them. And uh, one way of looking at this is that the more cores you add, the more strain you put on that bus. Yeah. And certain codes that, that use the main memory a lot, they can't cache or have bad ac- access patterns, they're, they're always going to be bottlenecked here. Um, so yeah, we say optimize for your cache performance. Uh, this is getting really unsatisfying for me. You know, there's as as like a system owner, yeah. you've hired the smartest people, some of the smartest people on the planet in, in HPC, and you've given them the best tools money can buy. They're working on huge systems on really difficult problems. I mean, these guys are pushing the forefront of science, right? So yeah. maybe we can cut, cut them some slack. You think we can cut them some slack? I, I think we can. <laughs> sure. <laughs> So, so may, maybe profiling code isn't the only answer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other reason this is kind of unsatisfying for me is that, yeah, you're optimized for cache performance. It, it's like, you know, eat your greens. Mm-hmm. Do you eat your greens, Rich? Uh, not as much as I should. <laughs> I know. You, you, you could eat more. You yes. could always eat more. Yes. It, it's, it can't possibly be the whole solution. Mm. So what I was thinking this um, early this month is, can we tune the cluster do a better job of running these codes. If we assume this is this is the best the code can possibly be, yeah. And at the moment, it's certainly the best it is. This is just reality. This is how it is. Yeah. Um, the smartest people we have have made it as fast as they can. What can we do? And we do a lot of tuning with linear performance reports, but mostly it's kind of MPI or I/O bottlenecking. You know, things like where you can put different processes on different nodes to improve the connectivity of the the network and so on, right? Yeah, um, and there's a lot of people working in a lot of very smart areas here, uh, and IO is a similar. It's a shared resource. It's very easy to get bottlenecks, and you can you know tune your whole cluster to perform better for a particular application. But here, this is really the performance within one node. Can we tune the cluster for that? I mean, so tuning for performance, yeah, really no, right? Because mm-hmm. you're not going to break that bottleneck by tweaking your config. Yeah. Um, but what about energy efficiency? Hmm. Because in, in in this kind of simplified view of the world, you've got all these cores, and some of them, or some percentage of the time, is spent waiting. Yes. 
And this comes back to your first question. What are they doing yeah. when they're waiting? Uh, maybe they're just burning jewels for fun. Yeah. Keeping track of the time, right? Counting. Keeping track of the time. Probably. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, maybe the situation could be better. So I, I figured that, yeah, there's, there's a number of things you can do to improve energy efficiency in HPC. Everyone wants to be a green. And I, the first time I heard of the, the green 500, I thought it was literally just the top 500 with green LEDs because it's cool. Yeah. Um, and this is the, the industry standard way to solve this problem is to put in a funding proposal for a new cluster, right? Uh, and I guarantee you, if a proposal for a cluster that uses the warm water cooling to heat your espresso is yeah. a guaranteed fund. So that's kind of a solved problem there. But can we, can we do clever things? Can we reduce the CPU frequency scaling? Mm. Um, I was talking to some guys on the, uh, the job scheduler front recently, and they're doing some very interesting stuff here for decreasing the, the frequency on jobs that aren't, on nodes that aren't being used and things like that yeah. to save energy. Mm-hmm. Could you just, if, if, you, if all of your cores are bottlenecked on the memory bus, could you just run with fewer of them? Mm. Operating systems these days can do something called core parking, where literally a core is powered down when it's not being used. And mm. it, from one point of view, that seems like kind of crazy, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I bought all these cores, and now I'm going to turn some of them off to save power. Y- yeah, I mean... I could turn them all off and save all the power. <laughs> right. You spent a lot for that premium uh, Xeon <laughs> chip because it had all those cores and the bandwidth, right? So, yeah. Yeah. But on, and certainly on, on it, for the Linpack benchmark, run all those cores. That's great. Yeah. But maybe some kind, maybe there are some kinds of codes where that doesn't, that's not necessary. Mm. So these these are kind of the two questions that I had. I mean, the first one's a slam dunk, right? Problem solved. But for those of us who who aren't going through a funding right. procurement process or whose governments are perhaps um, not as reliable as we'd like, yes, w- what can we do here? And th- these two questions, I decided to run a little experiment. So I took a very simple, simple code, a, a 1D wave equation solver. We use it for a lot of example stuff. So I know it inside out. Um, and I just run this on a single compute node to minimize all this MPI communication stuff because obviously if you're running on fewer nodes overall, you're going to have a lot lower power drain. Yeah. Um, this is all in one node. And all I changed the CPU frequency and the number of cores on that node that I used. Mm-hmm. And I know I was really curious as to see if, if something could be done. So here's the kind of my, my benchmark run. This is the default frequency of 2.1 gigahertz, four procs per node. Uh, just a little run for 30 seconds. And this is kind of the, the report that you see on the left-hand side. This is what Perf Report springs out every time you do a run. Yeah. It just, uh, it's a so, web page, And we right? can see right off it's... Yeah. yeah. Sorry? It's a web page, right? It's I if mean, you... Yeah. Exactly. It's a web page. And you can do a PDF and print it out. There's a text mm-hmm. version. Okay. Um, you do uh, CSV output as well, which is going to be used later. Here we can see it's doing you know, it's CPU bound, very heavily bound on the memory access of this particular code. Great. This is the the reason I chose it because I know that this code is memory bound. And if you look at the energy breakdown, this is new in Perf reports. Um, most people don't have this yet. This will be coming out later in the year, and we'll be demoing this at supercomputing. Okay. The we got we got some figures here. Okay. Yeah. So given that's our benchmark run. I dropped the frequency right down to 1.3 gigahertz and just ran the same same code again. And the first the first thing that struck me is it it was almost as fast. Hmm. Okay, I've I've almost halved the the clock frequency yeah. and it's only four seconds slower. Um, because I mean it is slower, so although it saved energy, it didn't save quite as much as you might have hoped. Yeah. Um, well, but despite uh... it's running it's running for longer and it's using less energy it is an interesting trade off. Yeah, because uh, you saved yeah. something like, what, 30% on the energy? Something like that. Um, right? I think more like 15%, but yeah, okay, yeah. It's, it's, non, it's non-trivial. Yes. But the, there's, there's you know, a lot of different things that we can tweak here, the number of pox per node and so on. So I did the rest of the runs with um, the CSV output and both reports. You just dump it all into Excel and do some pretty graphs, and yeah. I came out with this. So this is what you look at just for the, the, the percentage slowdown. Mm. Because I was really, really intrigued by this four-second slowdown. So what we have here, the the different gigahertz frequencies I used on the left for the clock frequency of the, the process and the number of cores down the right. Yeah. Um, and there's this kind of blue flat plateau between sort of four cores and eight cores between 2.1 gigahertz and 1.7 gigahertz, where it doesn't really matter what you do there, you've got about the same performance. 
Mm. And as you'd expect, then dropping the frequency way, way down to 1.3 U, you really start to hit some slowdown, like 20, 30% slowdown, yeah. which is less than you'd expect from the, the pure frequency, mm-hmm. which I think is, is demonstrating that, yes, this code was memory bottlenecked and yeah. the core frequency wasn't quite as important, but still, we're certainly hitting some performance problems there. Yeah. And as you drop down to just two cores, then you know, the, the performance really drops off mm. because this code paralyzed quite well. Okay. Um, but there's this fascinating sweet spot, and I love sweet spots. Here's one. <laughs> at 1.7 hertz, yeah. it's running just as fast as at 2.1. E- equal. So there must be some power savings there. Yeah, equal. I couldn't measure the difference in time. Interesting. Yeah. So if we now look at the energy figures that performance reports give us, there's that same sweet spot. Look at that. You're getting between 5 and 10% energy savings. For zero performance impact, just by tweaking the yeah. CPU frequency, because we because we saw the report and thought, hey, this is yeah. bottlenecked on the memory. Yeah. The other thing interesting here is if you look over on the right, there's this you know, you can get up to 15% energy savings by playing with these things, and this one is actually by dropping the number of cores. Mm. And it's non-obvious that that should happen, right? Because you know this code scales well. Yep. And by decreasing the number of cores. You you should just be running for longer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's not happening. And the the reason that's not happening is that this this cause per node, not causing total. If you increase the number of nodes, the code scales scales great. But yeah. increasing the number of cores within a node, it's bottlenecked on the memory. If we flip back over to look at this data point on the run length, that was only twenty percent slowdown for fifteen percent energy savings. So if time's not completely critical, despite running twenty percent longer, it still uses fifteen percent less energy overall. Mm. So there's there's certainly some play here. There's certainly some trade-offs to be made with these kind of jobs. Um, but this is just one particular program on one particular system, right? Yeah. Um, you can't run everything at half speed or, or stop using the quasi board. Yeah. And again, some jobs really, really use them. And looking at how kind of noisy or not so much noisy, but nuanced these graphs are, by just picking, say, oh, 1.7 gigahertz or fewer cores, you could have made some really, really bad decisions if you didn't have the data. Yeah, right, right. So I, I, love, I love this stuff because it's fascinating, all these weird little little things that you wouldn't expect. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, my takeaway from this is that everything, everything is different. Yeah. You know, you, there's never going to be the, the one perfect solution for every system and every, every job. Mm-hmm. But... I was pleased. I was really pleased to see that you can actually measure this. And when you start bringing accelerators into the mix, like GPUs, yeah. which if you're not using the GPU, it still drops power, even when it's idle. Quite a lot of power as well. Yeah. Um, and you can measure the full node energy. That includes your disk access, if you've got local disks or SSDs and stuff. Um, there's so many variables to play with here. And there are certainly gains to be found. And there's the, the opportunity, I think, if you're... Giving out, handing out large allocations on a sniffing cluster. Yeah. Say, hey, you know, let's see a report. And some people are doing this for, for, for performance with yeah. perf reports. Ready to say, hey, I want to see a perf report. Make sure you're, you know, going to be running at high speed or making use of my accelerators or whatever. Um, make sure it's not wasting power. Why not? Why yeah. not? Sure. You spend a, a few small, small trial runs, and you could be saving a significant amount over the lifetime of the this year mission mm-hmm. critical code. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, your procurement is the the big place where we make energy efficiency gains on these right. systems. But in any case, it makes sense to check that your new architecture is going to be a good match for your codes. Yeah, yeah. Stuff like this is... That's fascinating. Fun. I mean, you know, Mark, I've been reading about the... Were these Haswell processors, by the way, or some or something a little... This older? is a Haswell, yeah. Yeah, because I was reading that. Uh, these things get really hot um, when that, oh, whatever yeah. that turbo mode or whatever kicks in. Uh, that you really yeah, have to provision the cooling. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. Um, but but how are you manipulating the core count and the frequency? Is that through Moab or a job scheduler or something you mentioned, or, or is it the OS? Well, I was running. A, I, I had I had root access to the single node, so I was using a CPU frequency setting in, ah, in Linux. Okay. Okay. And, but you can you can do this with you can do core frequency selectors with most of the job most of the, the, the okay. job management systems now. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, if we look at this just in terms of money, right? Uh, you know, a multi-kilowatt system or a megawatt system, a megawatt is a million dollars a year in the U.S. You know, it's real money. But 
if yeah. you could save fifty more over here. Yeah. Know. Okay. So if you could save fifteen percent on that by these manipulations, that's serious cash, and you're still getting the job done, right? Uh, yeah. It's so fascinating. This, potentially, there's money left on the table here. Yeah. 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 That that's money you could spend on a hire a researcher or a, you know buy more equipment yeah. or. Or whatever. Hire right? another application support guy, and he'll <laughs> get your codes running even better. And you save even more money. Yeah, yeah. Or you know, some more Ale- Alinea licenses maybe for the rest of your team or whatever it is. So, um, <laughs> I'm I'm sure I'm sure you've already got licenses for. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so so what's the what's the lesson here? I mean, uh, you have the instrumentation to provide this data, right? On on you know any yeah. kind of code that you're running, right? Um, is it yeah. worth running these experiments, you think, for the typical um, HPC center? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you you never know what you're going to find until you look. Yeah. And what I, what I love and what a lot of our customers love about Map and Perf reports is it makes looking very easy. Mm-hmm. When it's very easy to look, then you can see things that you wouldn't have found otherwise. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's what makes this show fun. Yeah. And Maybe you find nothing, but I... I'd, I'd, I'll be prepared to bet anyone who comes and, and finds me a supercomputing <laughs> a, a good couple of beers that they'll find something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, because uh, we live in this multi-many-core world, and uh, this contention problem is not going away. It's only going to get worse. I mean, uh, whatever, Knight's Landing might have 60 cores in there, right? Um yeah, right. And so, Knight's Landing is doing something very interesting and putting much more memory um, available to the cores. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, again, this is still just another level of cash, and the jobs will adapt and change, and people will be wanting to use, you know, getting towards terabytes of memory per node in yeah. a few years' time. Mm-hmm. There's there's always more demand there. Well, certainly, and if you could free up cores, I don't know if this would help or not, but, you know, with things like virtualization, you might be able to go off and run something else over there um, and, and play <laughs> with that as well, right? Uh, yeah, you know, um, my favorite would be Bitcoin mining, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, cool. Yeah, cool. So, so is is this shipping, Mark? Is this capability? Is this something I can run today on Alinea tools with the performance reports? And... If you if you ask us very nicely, this is we can give you access to. We, we've done that to a couple for a couple of um, a couple of interested users. Yeah, this is something we're demonstrating at Supercomputing. Yeah. And we'll be uh, announcing some kind of beta program for early access then as well. Terrific. Well, uh, does the experimentation continue, or you know, what's what can we look forward to? Absolutely. Yeah. We're going to be running a competition. We're going to be running a competition at Supercomputing. Uh huh. Um, guessing the energy profiles of various different codes. Ah. And I'm going to have a lot of fun putting that together over the next few weeks. Okay. So so people will be able to access something online and and enter. Um. Uh, no, literally, just come up to the booth like we did okay. last year and yeah. see a whole bunch of different reports right yep. up there on our wall. Okay. Um, and talk about them and try and work out what what's going on. Ah. Are there prizes involved? We had, I think, we had a pretty cool prize last year. What did we have last year? Um, I think we were giving away some kind of tablet last year. Yeah, I, I seem to remember, uh, like an iPad or something like that. Cool, cool. I think the new iPad, or, or it might have been the new Kindle Fire, something like that. Yeah, yeah, terrific. So uh, I don't know what they're planning this year, but I'm sure it'll be good. Yeah. So so booth two eight three three at Supercomputing fourteen in New Orleans, and uh, we'll have to stop by and check that out. Absolutely. Hit me up. I'll buy a beer. Okay, that's a deal. All right, Mark. Well, hey, I I really appreciate you sharing this with us, and uh, thanks for coming on the show today. It's been my pleasure, Rich. Have a nice day. You bet. We'll see you next time. That's it, folks, for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.